Go ahead and uh, state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Lisa Dykes. And can I approach you? You may. Uh, you have a very soft voice, so I want you to make sure you keep your voice up and speak sure. into the microphone, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So the members of the jury can hear everything you have to say. Can you do that for me? Of course. We've heard a lot of what Charles Beltran, Chuck 50, 50 had to say, and now it's your opportunity, right? Yes, sir. All right. Um, so before we go into um, the things that Chuck testified to, um, I want to talk about you first. Can you tell members of the jury um, uh, <laughs> how, how old are you? I am 60 years <laughs> old. I was hesitating because you're not supposed to know <laughs> how old they are, right? No, that's perfectly okay. I'm okay. 60 years old. All right. Um, Ms. Dykes, uh, let's talk about, we heard a lot about you being a, uh, I guess, mm -hmm. paralegal. Um, tell them the truth, where were you born? I was born in Somerset, Kentucky. Okay. And at some point, we're not going to go over your whole history, all the husbands, how many husbands you had? I've had I've had three husbands, and then of course I'm married to Nina. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. um, many of the uh, relationships you kind of want to forget about? Um, I would like to forget about all three of the relationships with the men that I've been married to. Quite frankly. Okay. Uh, let's fast forward, and let's just get to the point. Uh, you were working at the time. In, uh, let's talk about 2020. Let's start there. Okay. But before we do, do that, I did want to briefly um, talk about your, your children as well. Yes, sir. Uh, how many kids do you have? I have three. Three? And what are your, your, your children have? Uh, Chelsea, who's 40. And the state talked about her earlier, right? Yes, they did. Okay, who else? Aaron, who's 39, mm -hmm. and Kyle, who's 34. As far as them being present here, do you have concerns for their safety? Absolutely. I would not want them and don't want them exposed to having the same issues that Maricela experienced. Chuck is a violent man and I don't want anything to happen to them. Okay. Um, and in fact, we'll talk about that, but I also want the members of the jury to understand that before you met Charles Beltran, you had a life, right? Absolutely. I have a good life. I had a good life. And everyone is trying, or it seems like the witnesses that have testified are making it seem like you were dependent on me. No, that's actually not true. I've been a litigation paralegal for 34 years, so I always had a glass ceiling in my income. Nina actually made um, about the same amount of money that I did, and she's an attorney, so I was making quite quite a good salary at what I do. Okay. Like I do the litigation work, so it, it pays well. Okay, and as far as uh, Nina, uh, what type of attorney was she? Nina was actually working for the city of New York, so she was working for a governmental agency, which doesn't pay as well as private sector anyway. So she was working for the city of New York doing housing work, so she did in a different area of law than me too. So it's not the same, it's, it's not similar. Okay, and, and just while we're on the subject, um, Nina, uh, they said that she was married to William or Bill. Yes. Uh, he subsequently passed. He did. Uh, when Bill passed, where were they living? Um, they weren't living in Pennsylvania, as you've heard before. Nina and Bill had a house that was in Staten Island. That house was way overfinanced and upside down, basically is the best way to describe that house. The house that was in Pennsylvania was a house that Nina bought and paid for, and she paid $60,000 for the house. Okay, now so when that, you say the house that was in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. that wasn't the house that uh, her and Bill lived in, right? No, they, right. they paid very little money for this house. That was a four-bedroom house, four-bedroom, three-bath. 
but the house was in poor condition, so they would only go there. Nina would go sometimes by herself on the weekend, but she didn't live there. They did not reside there. Okay, and the other interesting thing, that house was in the same neighborhood that her parents were in. It was, it was abutting. So it was exactly like the lots almost met. From the upstairs bedroom window, Nina's bedroom window, you could see Nina's mom and dad's house. So it was right there. Okay, and I just want to briefly touch base on that. As far as Nina and her parents, mm -hmm. uh, she didn't have a good relationship with her parents, right? They had been alienated from the time Nina was like 15 or 16. They spoke, but it was very seldom, and they were not close. And this was um, something that gave Nina a lot of concern. She was emotionally, like, very much wanting to have that family back. So one of the reasons that she bought this house was so that she would be able to see them and possibly reconnect. All right, did y'all invest a lot of money in that house? Yes. Um, Nina had decided to put the house on the market in like April or maybe even March before she and I got married. So she couldn't afford to borrow the money because she was upside down at the house in Staten Island. She was trying to sell it so that we could get out from underneath that mortgage because it was large. So she couldn't afford to, to fund the money or to borrow the money to fix this house to put it on the market. So whenever we got married, one of the first things that I did was fly up there and we borrowed the money so that we could fix the house, put it on the market, and sell it. Okay, and um, I'm going over all that because there's notion that you were with her just for her money, is that true? No, absolutely not. Like, um, we both brought money to the table. God blessed us both in being able to make a good living. And it was something that the marriage made us more solid financially. But I, I didn't need Nina to pay bills. Nina didn't need, need me to pay bills. We're together primarily because we, we actually love each other. I've known Nina for 16 years today. I knew Nina for 13 years before we got married. So we had been best friends that whole time. All right, and, and, and I want to get to the point, but I also want to make sure the jury understands, uh, as far as Nina's relationship with Bill, it wasn't a good relationship, was it? It was a horrible relationship. It was, he was abusive. Um, he did all kinds of things like stalking her in the area where she was staying. When they split and separated, Nina stayed in Pennsylvania. But Bill was like, like you had heard testimony before, he was parking on the street behind the house. So he was watching her in that house in Pennsylvania. All right, and the only reason I'm making reference to, because you got two women who basically had bad history with me. Very, mm -hmm. very. And at some point y'all befriend each other, fall in love. Well, we love each other. We love each other like sisters. Like this is a unique relationship. Um, I think we might think about marriage, Nina and I do, maybe differently than the average person. Not every marriage is based on sex or, you know, that physical connection. Nina and I are supportive of each other in every way other than that. Like, we love each other like a sister. We love each other, like, truly. Like, anything that Nina's going through, I want to help her with that. Anything I'm going through, Nina wants to help me with that. Okay, let me, let me stop you there because uh, I want to make sure we continue to move on, but I mean, that's very important. Yes. But this, uh, y'all made a decision to, uh, after y'all got married, to go by Lisa and Nina Beltran. Can you mm -hmm. explain to the members of the jury uh, how that decision came about? Yes. Um, my last name is slang, basically. A dyke is slang for a gay woman. And it would be just a horrible name for us to take as a last name for us. Pennsylvania allows you to change your name to any name that you choose to whenever you get married. So when we looked at the names that we wanted to take as a last name, Dykes is right out of the picture. So Murano is not really a name that we wanted to take because of her relationship with Bill. So we looked at other names of people that were around us or, or names that were of interest and Beltran was an interesting name. It means raven in Spanish, and it has a history, and it's just, it was a better name. We asked Chuck if he had a problem with us taking it. It was not in any kind of connection to him, but it was just a name that appealed to both of us, so we took that name. So you didn't take that name because y'all were obsessed with Charles Beltran? 
Absolutely not. All right, let's move forward. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, you abruptly leaving your employer. Was it abrupt? I had problems with my employer, yes, um, from from certain standpoint issues of, of bonusing. Okay, when you say bonusing, basically uh, you as a paralegal are doing all the work, because this was um, car wreck cowboy stuff, right? Yes. Uh, these are car wrecks. Yes. Y'all, you were working these cases. Absolutely. But he's making all the money. Absolutely. Now, were there other cases that you were working on with him as well? Yes. Um, in particular, we started to have an issue with a case that I had brought in, and I brought it in from my contact. It was a case that was wrongful death, and in personal injury, wrongful death cases settle for a considerable sum of money. Like, one of the bonusing structures that we had when we brought these cases in was a percentage of the settlement, right? Th this particular case settled for $3 million, over, a little over that. Okay, let me stop you there, just so the members of the jury know. Uh, Who did you get that case from? A friend of mine, a contact from mine, and she testified here. Her name was Catherine DeLeon. The hairdresser? Absolutely. Okay. Right. Absolutely. And she didn't get as much money as she thought she should get out of it. She surely did not. All right. But anyway, the bottom line is you were having issues with you making all the money, or you making all the money, but the attorney getting all the money. Yes, and, and not paying the percentage of, of bonus that I should receive. All right. And during this time period, uh, this early October, late September, uh, did you have uh, plastic surgery? I did. All right. And we have medical records to support that, don't we? Yes, you do. All right. Um, as a result of the plastic surgery, um, were you on medication for the pain? Yes, I definitely was. And, and, and did that affect your uh, employment? It did. Um, I could I couldn't be there, which was essential. I was at that point in time doing the negotiations for the firm. So if I couldn't make my nut, which that's a strange term, but if I couldn't meet the quota of settlements that we had, like the money for payroll was going to come out of save money back. So I needed to be there with the surgery. I could not be there like I needed to be. And I also, like, my focus wasn't as good as it should be whenever you're taking pain meds like hydrocodone, which I was taking at the time. Okay, and did that have a lot with, to do with um, you uh, eventually leaving? It did. All right. Um, as far as your... Um, This surgery. Uh, tell them the jury what, what type of surgery you had to There were two procedures that I had done, and it was a wedding gift for Nina, so I'll, I'll tell you that. Like, I had lost a considerable amount of weight, so I had extra skin, is the easiest way to explain it, and no tightness, like in my thighs in particular. So I had a procedure done on both legs called a thighplasty. And in that procedure, a triangle of flesh is actually cut out in the center part of the leg and then stitched back together to make your leg tighter and smoother, right? And I also had a lower facelift done because I, I had extra skin here. So I had both procedures done at once. Okay, and were these procedures extremely painful? They were. Um, my thighplasty ended up being a, a failed procedure. It, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Whenever he took the skin and tissue out, he took out too much. So when he closed it back, that, that first day it was okay while well, I was still in, in the facility. And it was a plastic surgery, surgery center that had an in-house like hospital kind of setting. So you stayed that day and then you were released home the next day. The very first day I went home, all of the stutures started popping out, first in the left leg and then in the right and it was immediate. So it was first like three or four, and then it was five, and then all of them. So I called the doctor, he told me to come back. I had to actually get an Uber to go back because Chuck was supposed to have been available to help take care of me some because Nina was in trial work. So I didn't want her to lose the, tri the trial work in New York 
It should have been an easier procedure than what it was, but the complications happen. All right, and as far as the, the complications that you're referring to, uh, do we need to check out some photos of that? You do. Uh, here's my approach. Show you what's marked as defense exhibit number 10. Uh, are these the medical records that we put on file with the court? Yep. And will they assist you in uh, testifying to the members of the jury the extent of the injury that you had during that time period? Yes. Okay. And the Uber ride back to the doctor's office that you're referring to happened when? The uh, very first day post, post the surgery. So okay. it was the first day I was home. So that would have been what day? I think these surgeries were performed. Hang on. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, I think the surgeries were performed like on September 10th, I think. So it had been September the 11th. Okay, so September the 11th. Uh -huh. uh, can you show me, well, Judge, I'll offer what's marked as uh, defense 10. you I wouldn't publish these yeah. right yeah they're but I apologize in advance they're they're not pretty uh, but if that anyone has any questions about the extent of the injuries you had to your thighs uh, these photos depict that do they not absolutely All right. um, and even in October uh, I think we made reference to you guys going to the um, to Arkansas. Were you having issues with your legs at that time? Yes. All right, and I wanted to ask you specifically uh, about the, the trip to Arkansas. How did y'all end up going to Arkansas? Um, the trip to Arkansas was unplanned. Whenever I had this procedure initially done, Dr. Armijo had told me that the surgery would be, my legs would be the best they were gonna be at three weeks. So. This was exactly three weeks post the surgery, right? Okay. So um, Nina and I had planned to go to California. We had tickets to fly to Los Angeles for that weekend, for October 4th. Were you able to fly to Los Angeles? No. I Why had, not? I had a doctor's appointment with Dr. Armijo that Friday before this weekend. He told me absolutely under no circumstance should I fly. So they were that bad that I, I couldn't really travel by plane with them because plane and the pressure in, in the plane itself was gonna cause that to be a lot worse. It would increase bleeding, it would increase the difficulties that I was having with it and worsen them. Okay, um, but as far as the incisions, what what is this photo I'm looking at right here? That's actually open fat tissue because there was no skin. I had none. Like the skin just, there wasn't enough to cover the wound. So the, the actual incision started to open in the beginning on the first day. And there's actually pictures of that too. Okay, so this reflects what? This what? is, yep, yeah, this is what it was like. And there's still, you can see on the edge, a few of the sutures that were left, those actually were completely gone. Commissioner Public Church. You may. You're not saying that uh, on October the first, your leg was uh, opened up like this, right? Oh, it was. Okay. It was. It was. Yes. Okay. Like I had started to use, um, I had to use special bandaging for this and special like treatment, wound treatment. So there's a, 
a particular chemical called hydrofarous blue that's on like a sponge bandage that I had to order through my plastic surgeon for it to be applied to grow skin. So I still had no skin at that time. Okay, so, but you, you, you had bandages on them. I did, I had to change them frequently, but I had them. Because they would bleed? They would bleed and they would also weep serous fluid. So it would weep white blood cells. All right, now as far as, I mean, can you explain to the members with the court's permission, can she, um, Kind of, I mean, explain to the members of the jury where, where your injuries were. They're exactly in the groin. Like, okay. it's right at the top. Like, they make a Y incision at the top of your groin, and then it goes all the way down the inside of your leg to a couple of inches above, above your knee. The place where I had no skin was right in the crotch. Right, so right, right in this there, area. Right there, yep. And would you have to have that bandage? There were four layers that had to go on. All right, all the way down? Uh, yep, to, to cover it to about uh, about two inches, three inches above your knee. Okay. Mm -hmm. But again, if they want to see the extent of what this surgery, uh, the damage, what is this I'm looking at here? That's actually the wound as it started to grow some skin. Okay. So, but when would this be? That's what it looks like without the bandage? Yeah, that's what it looks like without the bandage after it started to actually smooth out just a little and this is all brand new skin and serous fluid. Okay, so in the beginning of October, do these pictures accurately re reflect what your wound would have looked like post-surgery? They do. Permission to publish them? Right. these are open wounds, that's why you were taking the hydrocodone for the pain? On a scale of 1 to 10, I used to think having a baby would be, it was 10, right? With this particular injury, where this was, and pain factor involved, this is a 10, and having a baby is 5. Okay. So that gives you an idea of what that was in dealing with it. Okay, so just so I'm clear, Because of this surgery, um, what about your, the face? What? The face was still an issue, like I wasn't supposed to bend over, like you, you can't really bend over like this whenever you've got like surgery to the lower part of your face. Um, the pain from it was not as bad. I was a little surprised that my ear wasn't attached on my right side whenever I came home. So. I had a few things going on with that, and the wounds were still raw and open, but... Can I approach this? Remember the um, October picture uh, that the... Can I have one moment, John? Yeah. I'm going to keep these in order so you don't kill me. Why was, why, was, why was your hair pink like that? You know, 
I do kind of recall that. Like, I was looking for something fairly lively, and Kat actually picked that color out for me. And when you said Kat, you were referring to the hairdresser, right? Catherine Delion. On the photo that she put up that they were using, that she was testifying, with you in the pink hair. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, that photo actually shows uh, the injuries that, that you're referring to, doesn't it? It does. Once more to States Exhibit Number um, 86. Yes. Okay. Uh, where do you see the, um, I guess? It's right it, at the hairline right here. And this is what you're referring to here? The scar that runs right there. And also, there's a scar back here you can see. Right. Okay. And then I had another one under my chin, and I think you can see a little bit of that. Okay. Talking here? Here, right here, yes. Mm -hmm. And then in the back here? Right there, yep. And, and then, then under my area. my under my chin, there's a stitch. You can see it. And you can see that if you really look closely, mm -hmm. you can see the stitches mm -hmm. in your chin, right? Yes, sir. All right. And so you're not only dealing with um, the facelift surgery, you're dealing with your thighs as well? Yes, sir. Okay. And that affect your work performance, correct? It did. I mean, it affect your activity, period. It affected everything. Well, the doctor told you it might do that, right? He did. And so, as far as a lot of the restrictions you had, you definitely had restrictions, and you, know, you, you should have been watching what you lift. You couldn't lift anything at all. And why like, is that? because it could cause, on a normal surgery, even lifting was prohibited, because it could cause all of this to come loose again, as far as the facelift goes, and it would also cause strain in your thighs and cause them to open too. That's not the reason mine did, but it could cause that complication. Okay. All right, um, before we start talking more about uh, Charles Beltran, I did want to you know, these people talked about you basically looked like you had a midlife crisis or something like that. Remember Jimmy, your brother Jimmy? Yes. Saying that? Yes. All right. Let's, I want, can you talk about the blood clot problems you had before you met um, Charles Beltran? Yes, sir, I can. Um, in my 40s, I had an unusual medical condition that popped up. Like, I'm really driven to work. Like, I've raised three kids by myself. So, me working has just always been who I am. It's how, I, it's how I, I relate to life, I guess. So, I work more than I should. But I had been working a lot, so I ended up having a very unusual aortic blood clot. Now, aortic blood clot, what are those? Um, the aorta sits right underneath the heart. Right? So it's under here. So this means that a blood clot had to pass literally through my heart and lodge in this particular area of the body, which is what it did. So I had some very unusual symptoms in like stomach pain as opposed to what you would think. Whenever I went to the hospital, the blood clot had shattered. So it blocked almost every major like organ in my body. My, my kidneys, my liver, my large intestines, in both of my legs. So how long were you in the hospital as a result of this blood clot? 30 days. Right at 30 days. Um, 
was the, were these life-threatening injuries? Absolutely. They thought they told my, actually they told my children and me that I had about a 25 percent chance of living. If I did live through it, it was anticipated that I would be a double amputee because they knew they were going to have to cut off my legs from at least the knee down, if not more. Why? Because of the damage from no blood flow. I basically had zero blood flow. So that was a problem. So somehow they rectified the situation, you didn't lose your legs? They didn't rectify anything. Actually, um, my body pretty much dissolved the blood clot for the most part and thank God like I, I managed to come out and I, I was okay for 10 years. Then here in Texas, that first one happened when I was living in Florida. 10 years later, I am also in a position where I'm under a lot of pressure. And I was working trying to settle another case of a quadriplegic. So gentleman. just so the members of the jury clear, that's the first time you had a blood It's the first time. 10 years later, you had another blood Yep, blood. approximately six years ago, I had another one. So the second one was also an aortic blood clot, did the same thing. Like it, it was shattered, I had blood clots everywhere, all through my body. So they airlifted me from Mesquite to Dallas to Baylor Scott White, where it was the same situation again. Like I was in risk of dying from that point. Obviously I was airlifted, so like it wasn't a good situation, but I'm, I'm here. You survived. I am. After you survived that death scare, I mean, how does that affect your life? I think it affects any, everything. Like, whenever you come that close, not once, I mean, once is enough, but twice, I think you have to reevaluate your life, like what you're looking for in life, if you're where you need to be in life, and, and you know, you think about what's going to happen to your children and your future at that right. point. So so at that time, did you reevaluate uh, what you were doing and, and what things you wanted to do in life? Absolutely. So um, what, what happened after that? I've raised children, I feel like, from the time I was born. Like, you know, my kids are older, but they've always been with me and I've always been spending money on them. There's never enough money. It's gone before you get it. So my retirement wasn't right. It just, it wasn't where it needed to be. I obviously needed to start putting money back for retirement and get my life straight for that. And plus, I don't want to work all the time. Like, right. I didn't want to work all the time. So did you, you heard Jimmy say you kicked everybody out? That's what's, a, what, what's your version of that? That's, that's not correct. <laughs> like, I wanted to go back home to Florida. Like, Texas is great, I'm sure, but I, I'm from Florida. Primarily, I wanted to go back home. So the whole goal was for me to move the family back to Florida while I was waiting on some larger cases to settle so that I would have more cash flow. So we invested, I gave them the money for a down payment on a house. They bought the house, I helped to get them there, paid off my son's car so that he would be able to help pay that payment and put them in the house in Florida. So your plan was always to go back to Florida? Absolutely. Okay. Um, And at some point, you and Nina wanted to go back to Florida. It was always our intent to go back to Florida. In um, fact, did you have a business there? We did. We opened a business during COVID, a, a law firm together that was doing personal injury, and it was doing well. Okay. All right. Um, tell us how you met uh, Charles Beltran. He was working for my son, Kyle as a bouncer at a bar in Debello. I was actually looking for um, workers to work a poll, an election poll, for a local judge here in the civil divisions. And I needed, I think, 15 people under a certain age and demographic bracket to work this poll. So Kyle introduced me to several of the young men that are in the area and young women, and I got their phone numbers, they got my phone number to work this situation. Okay. Uh, how did you end up investing in draft career? I'm sorry? How did you end up investing in uh, <coughs> Chuck's rap career? Um, I met him in April. He reached out to me at some point. 
and he reached out to me to make connection. And it was primarily for someone to fund him in his career choices. Um, he, he actually talked to me from April on through the time whenever I moved the children out of the house in August. But he presented himself well. He also had had a fairly successful career in Austin. Not like what you heard here that was played. It was actually something where he was invited to a couple of locations and he was working with other people in his career, so perhaps they were the more talented aspect, but he had a more successful kind of career choice. But were you, you know, initially, again, was it a love interest name? No. Chuck was and continued to always be a business interest that went sideways. I bought the car as an investment um, and a tax deduction, basically, for him in his career. I set up a company for him called Math Class. That was his company for him to be able to do this music and to record. I mean, y'all helped him with a lot of legal stuff, right? We did. Uh, and, and before I forgot, the, the, uh, he had paternity issues. He did. He had paternity issues with Jasmine, and he had visitation issues with Emerald okay. out of Austin. And were y'all helping him with that? Yes, at his request. At his request? Yes. Um, any notion about you trying to steal Jasmine's baby? I raised three. I don't want any more babies. I okay. would never. All right. Um, I want to move forward and let's just get to the point. Uh, this trip to uh, Arkansas. Um, first, I think you indicated it wasn't even a scheduled trip. Not for me and Nina. How'd you end up going on the trip? Um, we had paid for them to go. We had paid for the hotel. We had paid for all of it for them to actually perform. It was a performance. Um, when we couldn't fly, to California, Chuck had two tickets that were his that were comp tickets. And he said, well, you know, who would I take but you two? Like, you've, you know, funded this, you're part of it, so will you go? It was like a, about a four hour ride, I think. So that's something that I could, I could tolerate. As long as I'm sitting down or laying down, that's okay, I could do that. Now so. you heard um, Dax and everybody say you were driving, is that true? No, I was in the passenger seat and it was reclined. Okay. So who was driving? Dina was driving. Okay. Um, when y'all are down in Arkansas, uh, you heard, I think it was Freddie, they were joking about Chuck having to come to your room to, to have sex with y'all. Did he come to your room and have sex with y'all? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, but did he come to the room and have a drink? I think he might have. I think he did. When y'all finished, when y'all, do you remember when y'all got back to Dallas? I don't remember exactly what time it was, but we checked out at about 11-ish, so I think it's a four-hour drive, which would put us mid-afternoon. Okay. Um, as far as uh, when y'all get back, who takes the van back? Nina and I took the van back. You didn't trust Chuck to take the van back? Absolutely not. Okay, so y'all take the van back? Yes. All right. Uh, once you take the van back, do you, do you recall what y'all did up at that point? I don't specifically. I think we stopped and got food and went home and watched TV. Okay. Pretty much. Um, and that would be October the 4th, right? That's yes, sir. Sunday. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I forgot, we had to go pick up the dog, because we had boarded him. Right. So we went and got the dog. And tell us about this dog. Uh, Chuck had brought home a dog. What type of dog? He was a pit bull mix. And, and the dog's name was uh, uniquely Charles. Okay. So we had a uh, dog. Who took care of that dog? I did. Did, did uh, Chuck take care of the dog at all? 
The dog hated Chuck. Absolutely. Um, when he brought the dog home, he said that he wanted it for some protection in the house, extra protection in the house. And he initially, the dog was okay with him for a while, but Chuck used to beat the dog. So the dog started to get to a point where he was growling every time Chuck was around. He was not having Chuck around. And what did that dog say? He slept in my bed. He stayed. Nina, then, Nina, 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 well, when Nina was there, did she sleep in the bed with you? Yes. All right. Uh, did, um, was he almost like a service dog to you? He was like a comfort animal, more than a service dog. So he, he stayed with us all the time. But you took care of him? I took care of him. And so when y'all went to Arkansas, y'all boarded him? We boarded him for that day. And when you got the dog? When you got the dog. Anything else? Uneventful happened on that, I guess, Sunday? Not at all. Recall? Not at all. Okay. Um, now, during that time period, was, was Nina working on a uh, big case? Yes, just as I had said, she had um, a particularly large case with a building that was in the city where the elevators were failing off and on. So, all of the tenants and the tenant association was really upset with it. Was she receiving and sending, uh, I guess, packages back and forth? Yes, in particular, discovery. So she was in um, a process of discovery on this with maintenance records and dealing with the maintenance people that work for the city of New York with this building. Okay. Um, on that weekend, she's working on her case. Was she anticipating some documents? She was. Uh, I guess that Monday, was she still looking for the documents? Yes, they were supposed to have come in, I think, Monday morning in early delivery, but they didn't show. Okay, because the documents didn't show, what, what did, what did y'all do? Well, we were kind of in dire straits because Nina really needed them because when she flew back, she had like a hearing, I think. So it was something that we had to have. So she started to look for where the documents were. In short, later that evening, did y'all go to a FedEx? We did. All right. Um, and you've seen the, um, we talked about the FedEx that, that you went to. Uh, it wasn't in Wilma, was it? I don't believe it was, no. It was more toward the Hutchins area, maybe? Okay. They, um, Tell me to the jury a little bit about the uh, FedEx location you ended up going to. Um, it was one of the larger distribution centers in the area. Like it's it's like a, a major kind of hub area. So it's one of the bigger ones. And is it all 45 though? I, I believe it is, yes. It's not in Hutchins, right? I mean, it's not in Wilmer, but it's in Hutchins. I think so. And is it in that same vicinity that they're, they're saying that your phone's ping? I believe it is.
address, uh, what is it, 274 uh, Fern Tree? Yes, sir. And Wilmer, you did live there at one point. We did, yes. Like back in 2016, right? Yes. Uh, is that how you knew about this FedEx distribution center up in Hutchinson? It is. I used to work in downtown Dallas for uh, another law firm, obviously, and I, I pay attention to where these FedEx centers are because I use them a lot. So it's part of what I do. And a lot of times you have to drop off and you need a place that's a bigger facility that has longer hours or you know that it'll ship quicker. So I always pay attention to those things. Okay, now, uh, as far as this facility was concerned, y'all were picking up. Yes. Or Nina was picking up. Nina was picking up for Mark, yes. They had sent her a package that she needed. Okay, and she had been trying to locate that package. She did try, um, but it's so hard and she needed it really quick. So like tracking it electronically wasn't working like it needed to. So it just made sense to go someplace and get some help with it. All right, now when y'all go down to this distribution center, um, well, if I told you that the address was uh, 1101 East Cleveland Road in Hutchins, Texas, would that be about right? Yeah, I believe so, yes. Uh, um, and how, how far would you say that that's from your house? I think it's probably a 20, 25 minute drive, maybe. From a seat? Yes. Just hit 635, 20, boom, you're there? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. Um, May I approach it? You may. Let me show you what's marked as um, defense exhibit number 11 and 12. The last I had was defense exhibit 10. Yes, ma'am. Let me show you what's marked as defense exhibit number 11 and uh, 12. <coughs> Um, does this look like a, I mean, it's just a map quest where we pulled up that location uh, in relation to <coughs> your home and where that FedEx distribution center is? Yes, sir. Uh, will this assist you in uh, testifying to the members of the jury the route that you recall y'all taking that day? It does, yes. All right. Judge Alloff, what's marked as defense exhibit number 11 and defense 12? Just so the members of the jury know, we're saying your house would have been somewhere up in here, right? Yes, sir. And then y'all travel to Hutchins here? Yes, sir. All right. Now, do you recall when y'all got on uh, 45, uh, what exit were y'all supposed to take? I don't know the number, but it's like Dowdy Ferry. Uh, let me show you what's marked as Defense 13. Uh, I mean, Defense 12, I'm sorry. And is this Dolly Ferry here? Yes, sir. Um, and just so the members of the jury know, when you come out 45, you loop and come in this area here, and that's where the distribution center is? Yes, it's someplace back in there. It's sort of like off. All right. So at some point when y'all are trying to get to the distribution center, do y'all miss the turn at uh Dowdy Ferry? Yes, we did. And where did y'all end up having to turn around at? I think it was like Wintergreen. Okay, so and would Wintergreen be in this area here? Would we say East Wintergreen? Yes. So you come further down 45 South, uh, exit is 273, and then y'all would loop back around, right? Yes, sir. And go back up, go back up till you get to the distribution center, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And this is basically what, what, what we see here, right? Going back up to the distribution center in this area. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, as far as the towers that they show, that you saw the state show, if you were in that area, would that explain why your phones were pinging in that area? I would assume so. 
Did you go to Wilmer that day? No. Um, other than going to that Wintergreen on 45 and looping back up to go to the distribution center, um, did you ever go to, what is it, um, I think it was 36, 3600 Pulse Oak and drop a body out? No, sir. All right. Uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit more about the distribution center so the members of the jury will understand. Uh, again, this is a huge distribution center, right? Yes, it's you, extremely when, large. When y'all get there, uh, do you have trouble finding somewhere to park? Nina did have trouble finding some place to park. There's a lot of folks that come and go from there. All right, and as far as that, was she trying to find somewhere to park up close at first? She was because obviously, like we generally do things together, but like I'm not walking any distance at all, so that's not happening. So at some point, she parked, tried to go in, or went in, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you didn't go in. No. Okay. At some point. Uh, is she able to, to pick up the package? She went in, but I think we might have been late. I'm not sure, but she didn't get the package. Okay. Um, after y'all leave that distribution center, do y'all, what do y'all do? We went back home. Uh, uh, did she subsequently find a way to get her package? I'm assuming she did. Like, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming she did. Or managed to get the documents another way. Okay. Um, at any time while y'all were in the <coughs> that Hutchins area, did you have uh, more settled with you? No. All right. All right. Let's let's get to talk about Charles Beltran some more. Uh, when we left off, we were talking about Charles the dog. Charles the dog. Uh, I want to talk to you about Mr. Beltran uh, working. Did he actually work for your son? As I understand it, yes. He was a bouncer at the club. And at some point he got fired, didn't he? Yes, he did. For his activities there at the club, right? Yes, he did. Not just being aggressive with the women. No, not just that. Okay. Issues he was having with other patrons. He was fighting every night, and he was a bouncer. So he was getting into altercations and fights every night. And is this something he would brag to you and Nina about? Yes. Okay. Uh, when you met him, did you know he had a felony conviction? No, I didn't, Ashley. Um, I didn't know what kind of convictions he had. He said that he had just gotten out of a halfway house. Okay. Um, what about the, the, the Santa Morta? Where did he say he got Santa Morta from? He did um, talk to me about Santa Muerta and said that he had learned about it while he was in jail. And then he practiced. So he, he practiced the religion. All right, and so the altar that we see in your home in Mesquite belonged to him, correct? It did. In fact, it's in the same, was that in his room or in the one of the other rooms? It's in the closet in his room from the picture. All right. And while we're on it, let's, let's talk about Pennsylvania and this uh, altar that's supposed to be in Pennsylvania. Can you explain to the members of the jury what that was all about? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, we listed this house for sale. Nina, being an attorney, had documents from private clients that she had that we had in a hall closet. It's a locked entryway closet, and there was a lock on it for a reason. The paperworks, paperwork and things that we had there were client attorney privileged. We didn't want that information out while the house was being shown. Her husband, Bill, had kind of a weird sense of humor. So in this closet, there was a, like a Halloween skeleton that's full size, like human sized. And he had put, because they were Mormon, a Mormon religious like piece of clothing on it. It's, it's like a, a long white robe. But it was bundled up in like on the floor of the closet. It's not anything else. 
So it was just a bunch of stuff and storage that we had in there that we kept locked, including paperwork that we didn't want shown to people coming to look at the house. Well, you heard the, the neighbor from uh, Pennsylvania said y'all were kneeling and kneeling to it, praying to it. Remember that? I remember her saying that, and I also have no concept why she would have said it. We never did that. Right. Did that skeleton have anything to do with Santa Moore? Absolutely not. Okay. <clears throat> okay, back to uh, Mr. Beltran. Um, now, you don't have any felony convictions, right? No. What you have some, uh, you have some death checks or something like that? There was um, two return checks to Costco that I didn't know anything about until I came here to Dallas on these charges, and they served me with those. So those return checks happened while I was in Pennsylvania. But those checks are on a rock wall? They're on a rock wall. Oh, and, and wasn't there something about a gun? What, what? Yes, gun sir. The airport? Yes. I had a, a very, very, very small antique handgun that was completely jammed. A bullet was jammed in the chamber, so it wouldn't fire, it wouldn't shoot. I took it to a gun shop that was really close to the house, but the gunsmith wasn't there. And I did it right before I was flying to see the kids that weekend. Forgot I had it. When I got to the airport, I realized the minute I was going through security, I was like, no, I have a gun in this purse. So I told them at the spot that I did. I was never actually arrested on that charge. Like, it was a situation where they told me if I had, like, a, a concealed carry permit, the gun wouldn't have been an issue. I could have taken it back out and put it in a locker or in the car and gone on the trip. But I was never actually arrested with that. I was stayed at an airport facility, and it was dismissed, and I left and went home. Okay, but I do want to ask you, Chuck did carry a gun, didn't he? All the time, every day, any place that he went. I want to talk to him. When did he actually move in with you? Um, he moved in in August, whenever the children moved out to the house in Florida. Uh, and I say moved in with you, I mean, you're not the only person he lived with, right? No. I mean, you knew he had an uh, apartment, right? Absolutely. Or an apartment that he also stayed with some other women. Absolutely. He stayed in a couple of different locations with women, I believe. But particularly one woman uh, this Carmen, right? As I understood it, yes. Uh, and it wasn't just Carmen, there was other women at that place too. Yes, from what I understood. Um, so he moves in, you buy him all that studio equipment. Yes. That's true. Absolutely. Uh, he sets up a studio in your house. He does. Uh, and is he working at first? He did. He was extremely devoted to it. He kept a, a whiteboard on the wall. He had scheduled songs that he was doing, um, scheduled recording times. He had someone coming over to help him produce. So he was actually doing what he was supposed to do. He was trying to create music to actually put on iTunes and make money off of it. And were you investing in that? Yes. Uh, the video that um, I uh, forced the, the jury to watch. Um, did you pay for that? Yes, I did. Uh, that video and the way he's acting on that video, is that Chuck? Yes, it is. All the time. That's not a show, right? That's, no. that's who he really is, isn't That it? really is him. that studio and as far as him bringing women, were you jealous about him bringing women? Absolutely not. As far as him uh, bringing people to the house, did you ever have an argument with him about uh, having some man that you ran into in your own house? I did. Um, I came home one night from work at 7 o'clock and I didn't know anybody was there. So I went to my room, changed clothes, came in, and got surprised in the kitchen by a strange man who walked out. And Chuck wasn't there. Okay, and did that upset you? Very much so. And Very did you let so. him know that? I did. Um, uh -huh. I told him that 
I, I really didn't want anybody in the house unless he was there, particularly men whenever I wouldn't know there was anybody in the house with me, so. Okay, but as far as these women, uh, you heard him say, hey, he brought women over there all the time. Is that true? He did. He would bring not one, sometimes two, three. And did guys some, sometimes come with them too? Absolutely. They'd be packed up in that studio, right? Absolutely. Uh, they were doing their thing, you were doing your thing? Yes. Um, oh, did he brag about pulling trains on people? He did. Now, what, what, is, what, what, is, what is pulling the train? Um, he particularly seemed to like having a friend of his, a male friend of his, come over to be with the girls that he brought home. So that's basically two guys and a girl. And they would brag, he would brag about it? Absolutely. What, did that make you jealous? No. I want to fast forward to the early morning hours of uh, October 5th of 2020. Was Nina there? Yes. You were you and Nina there in your room asleep? Yes, with the dog. Um, on that day, did you ever come come in contact with uh, Maricela? No. When Chuck arrived there with her, according to the phone records, mm -hmm. in the early morning hours, did you ever know he was there? No. Anything unusual about him arriving at your house in the early morning hours? No. You heard him say that uh, at some point you came into that room and you stabbed Morisella. Did you go into that room and stab Morisella? No. Did you struggle with Morisella? No, absolutely not. No. Did you argue with Chuck about Morisella? No. Had you ever met Morisella? No. In reference to um, This whole Chuck Marcella ordeal, how did you find out about it? I found out about it whenever the FBI agent showed up and called me on the phone. Okay, now before that, um, had you gone into Chuck's room and cleaned his room up? No. So as far as whatever blood was in there, who cleaned that blood up, you have no idea? I have no idea. You just know it wasn't you? I know I wasn't, no. I didn't go in the room, I, no, it wasn't me. Okay, it wasn't Nina? It wasn't Nina. On that night, you don't know how many people he had in that room, do you? I have no idea. The next morning, did you ever come in contact with Marcella? No. Did you come in contact with Chuck? No. At some point, he leaves the, or at some point you, you start driving the Audi, right? Yes. Because on the, the night of October the 5th, or the early morning hours of October the 5th, who's in the Audi? Chuck. Uh, that next day, who was in the Audi? Chuck. <clears throat> All right, you heard the FBI agents say that uh, they came to talk to you. Right. All right. You tell the members of the jury what you remember. Um, they apparently came to my house. I was at work. I was working. So I got a phone call from an agent that claimed he was an FBI agent while I was on the clock at work. So I talked to him there. Um, his conversation with me was basically, um, do you know Chuck Beltran? Or Charles Beltran, I think was what he said. And I was like, yes, I do. How do you know him? He lives at the residence with me. So he lives there. Now, let me stop you there. Up to this point, do you know anything about some missing girl from Seattle? No. you know anything about Charles Beltran uh, being the last person seen with Marcel? No, I had no clue. All right, then what happened? So 
I told him uh, who he was, that he lived there. The agent didn't go into a whole lot of detail. He said something to the effect that he was the last person seen with a girl who was missing. And that was pretty much the gist of it. He asked me the last time I had seen him, which I think I told him it had been about two weeks, because at that point it kind of had been that long. So um, he asked me that. He told me when I spoke to him to let him know that he was looking for him, which I did promptly. I told him that. So after you talked to the agent, you immediately called him? I called him. I said there was an FBI agent that showed up at the house who called me and said that he's looking for you. Here's who it is. That's pretty much what was said. Okay. Um, did Charles go into detail about Marcel at that time? No, he did not elaborate. He didn't say anything else about it. He was like, okay, he took the number, supposedly, and that was that. Did he seem worried at all? No, not even a little. Not a concern in the world? No. That the FBI was looking for him? No. I do want to kind of backtrack. Uh, at some point, we talked about Beltran Charles being in the car uh, on October the 5th. At some point, did you drop Nina off at the airport in that vehicle? Yes. I, How did that take place? I think her flight left on that Wednesday. And whenever I got up to take her to the airport, and then I was going back to work that day because I hadn't worked Monday or Tuesday. so. When I went out to the garage, the Audi was there and my Hyundai was gone. So I, I took the Audi and drove to the airport and went to work. All right, just so members of the jury know, that's really nothing unusual, right? No, it did wasn't. He, um, did he have keys to both vehicles? Yes. All right. And you put gas in it, he'd run it out? Bring it, drop it off, I'd have another one. And he would do that while I was at the office too. I would not see Chuck. I would just go out from the office and a different car would be parked in my spot. So. And did that create problems for you at the office as far as your, 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 your files and your documentation? Yes, because... Explain that to the members of the jury. Yeah, whenever you go home and you work from the office, like sometimes I would need the actual hard physical file. I couldn't just access it by online application to the office file. So I would take the physical file with me. So they would typically be in the back of my Tucson. So I could get them or I would take them back to work and they would be in the car. So when he would change these vehicles or leave with my vehicle and I couldn't get to it and I had a file in the car, that's a real issue because they're active files and something that's being worked on every day. That can cause me to get fired. So him taking the vehicle and me not able to get a hold of him or him trade it back or me being able to get to that was a serious issue for me. And you saw the phone records earlier showing that you kept trying to contact him? Yes, sir. Do you think that's what that was about? I'm pretty sure that's what that was about. Okay. Did Charles ever tell you uh, what happened to Marcel? No. What did he even talk about? No. I'm saying even after y'all realized that, that he was wanted, you were wanted, what did he talk about? No. And I, I didn't know I was wanted until... Okay, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. As far as, um, after you talked to this FBI agent, right? Yes, sir. Um, did somehow your address end up on the social media? Immediately. That same day. What problems did that create for you? It was havoc. Um, that very day that he called me, that night I was at home and I got a text message from someone claiming to be an FBI agent. It was very threatening. It was, I know you know where Chuck is. You need to have him here at such and such a time, such and such a day. Extremely aggressive. So, I, I mean, it really kind of throws you off. Like, I don't know who this person is. I actually texted this person back and I said, if you will send me a picture of your badge like your, your badge, your badge number, then I, I will communicate with you. Never heard another thing. What Not other issues thing. did you have after um, your address went viral? Um, while I was stuck with the Audi and hadn't been able to get the Tucson back, somebody slashed the tires while I was driving it. 
So it was it was really kind of aggressive. Like I was getting strange phone calls too. Like it it was out there. A, a full picture of the house was out there. It was not safe at all in any way, shape, or form. I had no idea who knew that, who who Chuck even had around him that was going to be coming where I was. Okay, you, you felt like um, all this threatening attention was coming from, from who? I felt like it was Chuck and Chuck's friends, Chuck's people, Chuck's surrounding people around him. And what about the people that were concerned with uh, Marcel? I'm sorry. Was there a lot of uh, social media stuff? Absolutely. It was everywhere. As far as I know, it was everywhere. So your, the fact that, I guess, your home, where you live, was on social media? Absolutely. And that gave you concern? Very much so. Safety concerns? Very much so. Um, at some point, will you tell the members of the jury why you uh, quit your job and went to Florida? Um, we had intended to go to Florida, but I didn't go to Florida first. Like, we still had the house in Pennsylvania. Okay. So, I mean, this was emotionally very, very, very stressful. Having my house out there, having people contacting me, the tires being slashed, I'm by myself in Texas. Like, I've, I'm still, like, my legs are a nightmare and a disaster. Like, I'm still trying to recover. It was awful trying to be here by myself and deal with that. Okay, so did you end up going to Pennsylvania where Nina was? I did. Nina and I had already planned that in January of that next year that we were going to move to the same location anyway. Like it depended on how the house sold as to whether we would go into Pennsylvania or to Florida. Well, but you, you it saw was the state uh, had a document saying you had just signed a lease. I did what sign a lease about? because I wasn't leaving until January and the lease was up on October the 1st. I didn't want to move furniture or do any of that, so signing the lease was the best solution. Nina and I talked about it, and I went ahead and signed it just so that we would have those three months from October until January for me to be able to, you know, finish out because there were a couple of larger cases that I was trying to resolve for the bonus before I left. All right. Now, as far as um, when did y'all actually put the house up for sale in, in Pennsylvania, if you remember? Um, I don't remember exactly when we signed the listing because the house had so much repair to have done. Like we borrowed the money around, I'm well, going to say, 100000 And that was for repairs on the house? For repairs on the house. It needed a new roof, it needed a new foundation, and it needed a whole new deck on the back. Okay, did y'all do all that? We did. We did affect all those repairs. Oh, and we had to tear down like a, a small like barn out building too, so we had to pay for that. And did that increase the value of the house? Yes, it surely did. Um, you hear, I guess everyone saying y'all were in a rush to sell the house. Um, we wanted to sell it, and we wanted that income because we wanted to buy a place in Miami, because that's where we wanted to live, and that's why we needed the money. Okay. That was the goal. Um, y'all needed the money to have anything to do with y'all being on the run. Absolutely not. At some point, did y'all sell the house in Pennsylvania? We did. Then what happened? Um, well, we had already moved and relocated to Florida, so we were, I was working in Hollywood, which is like a little outside area of Miami. So we started to look for a house or property, and we also considered the concept of opening a, a bar in the Miami area and Kyle actually managing it for us. So we were looking at a couple of different thoughts. Okay, let's backtrack. How did um, Charles Beltran end up in uh, Pennsylvania? Um, he knew about the property. He knew that we had the house in Pennsylvania. He knew that we had listed it on the market. So he knew where this house was. So we're in Pennsylvania. We had not actually talked to him he ended up in Bethlehem, which is just outside of East Stroudsburg where the house was. He called us and told us that he was there. So y'all didn't send for him? No. He just showed up? He just showed up. 
when he showed up, was he asking questions about the house? He wanted to know if the house had sold. Obviously, he was after the money. He wanted to know if the house had sold. He wanted to know where we were in the house sale. Okay, but uh, why are you putting up with Charles Beltran? Charles is a lot more aggressive than what you have been told. He was really bad as far as aggression goes. Um, one night in particular, he was trying to get a hold of me for money. Whenever I woke up in the morning, I had 99 missed phone calls from this man. 99. And he also, at one point, like, I had locked the door. He, his access into the house was through the garage door because he would come in through the garage. There's a, a door that went between the kitchen and the garage. So I locked that door. He didn't have a key to it. It really made him mad. When I got home that night, the door was broken. Like the actual door itself was split, the door. And he broke the frame to the point where you couldn't fix the latch on the door. So that was how mad and aggressive he was. Okay, so you hear all these women talking about how sweet he was. Is that the 50-50 the he's referring to? Well, it's not the 50 I got most of the time in the later days, but he could definitely appear to be. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay, let me ask you this. As far as, um, even after y'all found out he was a person of interest, why did y'all keep, um, why did you keep? I'm sorry, he was a what? After you found out, when did you find out he was a person of interest that the police wanted to talk to you? Um, on that, on that 13th phone call from the FBI. Okay, all right. Um, okay, at some point y'all go to Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, does he end up in Miami? He did end up in Miami, yes. Um, he pretty much, like, we had to go get him in Mexico. So when we came back from Mexico, Nina and I were already in between the move because we were in a contract on the house in Pennsylvania. Okay, let's, let's talk about Mexico. Why did y'all go to Mexico? Was that y'all's idea or his? His. Chuck wanted to go to Mexico. Chuck wants something, y'all make it happen. We made it happen because I didn't trust that I would not end up like Miss Patello okay. and Nina, like both of us, or our families for that matter. So you did what Chuck asked you to do? Absolutely. At some point, I want to go ahead and talk about when y'all find out, well, when Nina gets arrested. Y'all already set up in, in Florida, right? Yes. You already got your business plan, trying to relocate. Yes. Uh, you heard the agent say that uh, you were there the day she got arrested, is that correct? Yes. Tell them to the jury what happened. Um, Nina had sent me a text that led me to believe that she was either in the process of being arrested or arrested. My concern was us being able to have enough time for me to get an attorney, attorneys lined up for us, for us to be able to get something prepared before both of us were arrested and likely not to be able to do that. And is that what you did? That's exactly what I did. You got out of there? Yes. And eventually you got arrested? I did. When you got arrested, you saw the video, right? I did. Were you on the phone with, with a lawyer? At that time, sir, sure was. In fact, this lawyer right here? Yes. Um, Again, trying to make arrangements for you and Nina. Yes. I think you indicated that you actually even sent a uh, lawyer in Florida to try to help her. I did. I was extremely concerned about Nina's mental health from this. Okay, let me ask you, why, why were you concerned with Nina's mental health? Um, Nina's an attorney. Nina has spent an incredible amount of her time to be an attorney. <coughs> She is actually a Cambridge scholar. So Nina really has invested everything into this. This case, in and of itself, has destroyed us. The fact that they have brought this charge against me and Nina has ruined our lives. 
But ma'am, I'm, what I'm asking you about while when Nina was in jail in Florida, did she try to commit suicide? She or was on, on suicide watch. She was on suicide watch because of these things, because of this. So yes. And so when you see the text messages and you're saying you hope Nina keep her shit together. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. I, I did not want her to, to have a meltdown and try to commit suicide or effectively be able to do that. And I wanted her to have the knowledge that, you know, it's, it's okay. I've got defense lined up for us. I've got things started. It's, you know, it'll be okay. Um. You, I, I just don't want to make sure I don't, I don't forget because these girls that were at the apartment that uh, Chuck also resided in, uh, did you tell me, or what, what, did you say anything about uh, him potentially being involved in trafficking? I had suspicion that Chuck was involved with trafficking. Why? Because on a couple of occasions, like two separate ones that I can think of in particular, I found a suitcase at the house that was like in, in the living room area. It was just like a, a carry-on. And I, I looked, like, I looked to see what it was, and it was full of young girls' clothing. It was small sizes, young girls' clothing. Okay. All right. Um, after you got arrested... When did you uh, first find out about that you were being charged with capital murder? At the arrest in Florida, the arresting officer told me it was capital murder of a police officer and terroristic threatening. Okay, did you know what any of that mean? No. Um, at some point, were you... Uh, Were you uh, transferred back here to Dallas? Yes. Nina as well? Yes. All right. You're being held on a capital murder warrant? Yes. At that time, as far as uh, Mrs. Patel, Mrs. Patel, 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 Patello's uh, disappearance, did you know that they were alleging that you stabbed her? No. Not until I got here to Texas. That's the first time you found out that they were alleging that Charles was alleging that you stabbed Mrs. Patella? Yes. Did you stab Maurice Ellis? Absolutely not. Did you have any reason to stab Maurice Ellis? Absolutely not. Did you have some anger crazed breakdown because you were so obsessed with, with, with Charles? Absolutely not. So you find out that you're being charged with, uh, that they're alleging that, that, that you stabbed Marcel. And Nina Hill, right? That's what that I was heard. That was the allegation, correct? That's, yes, that's the allegation. both charged. Yep. Um, start going through the process. Yes. Eventually bond out. Yes. You get the leg marker. Yes. Um, while you're on bond and, and you have the leg monitor, are you and Nina still living together? Yes. Got an apartment. We got a house. Got a house. All right. Uh, once you're in this house, uh, does any specific, uh, specific <laughs> suspicious activity start taking place? Yes. Um, the entire t well, actually, it was the entire time that we were out on house arrest. People were people were posting things about us that they saw us in the actual location. Like, people were following us. People were paying attention to where we were going. So we were constantly 
underneath some kind of scrutiny by social media, by people who were following the case. Like, we never had any rest from that. They were always. In fact, it got so bad, did y'all actually try to do a cease and desist? We did. We absolutely did. Tell the jury what that means. Uh, a cease and desist is whenever you send a notification that they must cease and desist from publishing or doing anything against you or in your name because it was absolutely not correct or true. It was, uh, it was just made up things that were so derogatory it was affecting everything. So we did do a cease and desist on it. And did you feel as though it was putting you in danger? Absolutely. Were no you question. Correct? Yes. Um, then as far as the, uh, well, what, what I'm getting at is, at some point y'all cut those monitors off. We did. Tell them about the jury why. We cut the monitors off because we both felt very much persecuted in this case. I, I do as I'm sitting here in front of you today. I feel very much like Nina and I have been completely singled out in this case in a way that should not have been. Like you consider, I was 57 years old when this incident happened. I did nothing but work and raise children all my life. There's, I mean, why would I even be suspicious in this? I've never been arrested. I had no criminal record. Nina's an attorney. She had never had any kind of criminal record. Like we lived a life that was pretty much upstanding. We hadn't ever done anything like this. Well, this let me ask you. Okay, you say you felt persecuted. Yes. Yeah. But why, why, why Cambodia? Cambodia was a good place for asylum. Cambodia was a good place for us to find a new life, for us to live, for us not to have these situations. Um, we looked at it. We looked at citizenship. We entered Cambodia legally. We didn't do anything illegal. We did everything you were supposed to do to come into a new country and try to nationalize or to get asylum there. Okay, and you were trying to get asylum because you felt persecuted? Absolutely. And were you afraid? Yes, absolutely, both. For your safety? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, at the time, right before we left and flew out, there was a black pickup truck that had started to park right outside of our house. And it would move on the street, but it was always there. One day, I went to the window. Me and Nina were cooking in the kitchen, and this black truck is parked right outside our kitchen window. Whenever he saw us, he left. But it was definitely a man, and it was nobody we knew personally, and somebody that shouldn't have been there. And did that give you concern? Absolutely. So when you went to Cambodia, did you do so out of necessity? Yes. In, in our feelings, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I've always worked. Okay. In, in fact, did you get a job off? I did. While you were on the day one? I did. So it's going to help pay for your legal expenses? I did, yes. So and what happened with the job? Um, I got the job fairly quickly whenever we got out. My resume is really clean. So I got this position with the law firm. Um, he tendered an offer to me, which I accepted. With this leg monitor program, you have to get approval for everything you do, and you when, heard. When you, when you say approval, you got to get approval from the judge, right? I do. Yes, you. Anything you do. So, I I let my attorneys know that I had a job offer. They had to file a motion with a hearing before this judge to get this approved. There's a limited period of time, of course, because I had to start within a certain time range. I had given enough time for me my start date to give me like a week or about that, for the judge to give approval for me to do this the right way. The minute the motion was filed, and it was, you know, known by the prosecution, by, by the court system, that I had a job, and that it was with this firm, the offer was rescinded before the hearing could even take place. Okay. So, it was affecting your, your ability to, to work? 
it would have been an, it, it was an impossibility. Every time I would get an interview or try to get an interview, the time frame or me being able to get to that interview was impossible. And you didn't think that was a coincidence, did you? No, I definitely did not. Is that why you kind of felt like y'all were being persecuted? Yes, one of the reasons. Is that Charles Beltran? It is. And is that the uh, Santa Marta uh, case that he had? Yes. And uh, does this photo have significance to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty much an indicator that he and his people are watching. Judge Oliver, what's marked as uh, defense 13? No objection, Your Honor. Permission to publish your work. Defendant's exhibit 13 is admitted for all purposes, and yes, you may publish. Again, this is the Santa Morta emblem, correct? Yes. And this is uh, Charles Beltran, right? Yes. And he's telling you that we're, we're always watching. Yes. <coughs> is that, was that threatening to you? Very. Did you believe that he and his people were always watching? Yes. Is that why you went to Cambodia? Yes. Is that why you continued to send him money? Yes. To stay in contact with you. Yes. I've got some questions, Judge. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so, Ms. Dykes, um, you said you've been a paralegal for how long? 33 years. 33 years. And all in negotiations, right? No, not all in negotiation. I've done personal injury. I'm primarily a litigation paralegal, so okay. negotiation is not something I've always done. Well, you did negotiations here in Dallas, didn't you? I, I did for part of the time that I was with that firm. And you're no stranger to the courtroom. I mean, you know how, how things work. I mean, you've been, been in a courtroom in your job for a long time. Is that right? Yes. And uh, the soft-spoken uh, Miss Dykes that you are today, I mean, as far as negotiation, you're negotiating big cases. These aren't like little baby cases. I mean, these are important things, right? Technically, I didn't negotiate the big cases. I worked the big cases as far as the litigation aspects go. Okay, but you're talking to attorneys, you're talking to other um, negotiators, you're talking to companies about um, you know, their money and things like that. Is that right? Yes. And you have to be uh, fairly strong in, in your negotiations to get the job done. And you did get the job done, didn't you? You have to know the files. Uh, yeah, but you have to be strong in your negotiation to get the job done, right? You mm -hmm. can't just fall over at the first offer and say, okay, I give up, right? I you have to know what you're doing and you have to be strong. I think you have to be clear and concise. Okay. And um, as far as, um, again, you know enough about the legal field. You know enough about... Um, you know, what goes on in a courtroom to kind of understand uh, some of the procedures, right? I do. Okay. So, just a minute. I mean, you mentioned um, all these threatening things, and you were advised if there was anything that went wrong or anything else like that, you could either talk to Julian LaPere, your uh, ELM person, and you could talk to uh, the judge about what was going on, and you never did that, did you? No. Okay, so you never told him about any of these issues that you had going on supposedly during your time on ELM, right? You're a smart enough woman to know you could have told them any of that and they would have done whatever they could to make you feel better, right? Which issues are you speaking of? I'm particular? talking about this truck that's outside. I'm talking about uh, the people uh, supposedly harassing you. You could have talked to the judge about that, right? 
I feel that would have probably been ineffective. But you didn't try, did you? No. And you didn't tell Ms. LaPere about any of that, did you? No. She knew about the work problems. Okay. And that was it, right? That was the only problem that you really talked to her about, right? Yes. And you're making the, uh, this jury believe, I, I think, that you think the prosecution had something to do with you not getting the job, right? I do believe that. Okay. And you understand, Ms. Dux, we don't have that kind of time. I mean, if you don't know that, we don't have that kind of time. I don't know what kind of time you have and you don't, ma'am, honestly. Um, now, as far as uh, Ms. LaPere is concerned, she was here earlier. Your, your counsel had a... a opportunity to ask her questions about that situation, didn't he? He did. Okay. And um, Ms. LaPere, she didn't say anything about notifying or having to notify the prosecution or the court at every request that you make, right? She did go over what you can and can't do while you're on ELN. She also did, I believe, testify to the fact that you had to have approval to work. Okay. Now, I'm looking through all this stuff here, and uh, you were talking about uh, all these people that are harassing you and, and causing problems. And even before, uh, back in uh, 2020, before this incident happened, you know, all these terrible things that happened to you, and I, I can't seem to find a police report where you reported this stuff. You where didn't I, do that, did you? Where I reported what? Uh, these problems that you were having, these people that are harassing you, these calls that, that you're getting. You didn't report any of that to the police, did you? To be frank, ma'am, I don't trust police at this point in my life. Well, at that time, you had no reason to, did you? In 20? It, before you even knew that there was a, uh, that people were, that the police were looking for you and trying to contact you, you had no reason to distrust police at that time. The incidents that we're speaking of started to happen when the FBI agent showed up at the door on 1013. And there was nothing about that contact that would make you distrust police at that time, was it? At the time that they were there? At the time that the FBI contacted you on October 15th, you had no reason to distrust police, did the you? The text that night that I got from a gentleman claiming to be an FBI officer is pretty alarming. If he was an FBI officer, which I have no idea of knowing whether he was or not, that makes you start to distrust. Well, he's just stated on direct that uh, you asked for a, a picture of his badge and he didn't send you one. He didn't. And so at that point, I mean, you knew he wasn't legit, right? Not really. Like okay. the fact I that I mean, Taylor Page rang your doorbell, stood in front of the ring camera. You've seen that. That's how ring cameras work. When the when the doorbell rings, you have an app on your phone and you can see that video, right? No, I never saw the app. I never now I'm saw asking you, is that how the ring camera works? Uh, I didn't have the app, and it was Chuck's ring camera. So I didn't have any of that. So uh, speaking of Chuck, you mentioned, uh, I mean, you, you made it a point right off the bat to talk about how violent he was. Again, I'm looking through all of this stuff, and I don't see one police report that you called in on Chuck the entire time that you all lived together. You I didn't would, do that, did you? I would not have. I would not dare to have done that. He is not the kind of man you make a police report on and, and have anything come of that that's good. Okay, so he's not the kind of man. I mean, if he does something in your home that you invited him into, that you put him up in, that you bought him all that equipment, that you bought him that car, that you paid for all his shoes and his clothing and things like that, he's not the kind of man that you could call and report him to the police and he get arrested and be out of your life. That's, mm -hmm. how, that's how simple it was, right? It was not that simple. Chuck was now, not the kind of guy to... Now, you talk to... about Chuck's friends. Uh, Dax, Freddie, you know them, right? I do know them through the club. They've been to your house plenty of times, right? They have. Okay, and, and I mean, they talked about how everybody knew, everybody knew that you were in a relationship with Chuck, right? They talked about that. They said that, yes. Okay. And so it was common knowledge that this arrangement between you and Chuck really didn't have much at all to do with this rap career, if anything, because we saw a defense exhibit seven. And any woman that is trying to save her retirement and save up and make a smart financial decisions is not going to 
feed money into that man and that kind of wrath and that kind of video after she saw what was produced. That, that doesn't make any sense, does it? His first um, productions out of Austin, as I had said, were Ma'am, I'm asking about this so production. She asked, she'd be allowed to ask the question, answer the question. I mean, I understand it on cross, but... Sustain, please allow the witness to answer the question. The, uh, and my question to you is, after seeing what he produced on Defendant's Exhibit 7, uh, Picture Me This, where the lyrics are Dickity Dick and Lickety Lick, no woman trying to save her retirement is going to continue to invest in that, correct? That's my question to you. They may, if, if there's a potential for improvement, if there's a potential for it to change, to reflect what the actual work that was done before is produced, then yes, they might. But stay you're trying to save for retirement, aren't you? I'm trying to build a, an income stream that would sustain me through later years. Now, as far as um, the court proceedings go, as far as the court proceedings go, I mean, you bonded out in, uh, I believe, May of uh, 2021. Is that right? Yes. Okay, and, and Nina got out first, and you got out, and you, you all were able to get a nice little house together and uh, live together on, on ELM. And it wasn't great, but it wasn't that bad, was it? No, it's pretty bad. Okay, and um, looking at the past slips, um, Showing what's been marked states 398 through 402, and it starts with a 402. That's your signature right there, is that correct? Yes. If you'll just look through each of those, and do those look like the past slips in your case from the time you bought it out to the time you came again? Now, Your Honor, uh, state offer states uh, 398 three, uh, through 402 for all purposes. No objection, Judge. Okay. Uh, starting in September. Oh, hold on. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. 398 through 402. Yes, Your Honor. Are admitted for all purposes. Okay, permission to publish. Give me. Uh, looking at states 402. Um, this is September 21st. You signed that pass slip, and it just says discovery needed, right? Mm -hmm. You were here for yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, you were. You didn't talk to anybody, any prosecutors. You didn't have to go to the courtroom. You just talked to your attorney, and you left. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Stays 398, October 1st, 2021. Your signature is not even there, is it? No. You didn't have to even show up in court, right? I don't think so. I don't recall exactly, but I don't think so. Okay, but you would have signed it if you had to show up, right? Possibly. Okay, uh, October 29th, 2021. Again, your signature's not there, right? Right, yes. So, so uh, you didn't sign that pass slip either. Uh, November 29th, 2021, you didn't sign that pass slip, and that's in States 400. Yes. And then uh, on... 
December 29th, 2021. You're actually in Cambodia at this time, right? No, that's November 29th, 2021. Okay, but it's reset to um, December 29th, 2021. Is that correct? It was reset to that day, but the day of that signature was November 29th, 2021. Okay, and you didn't have to sign that day either, right? No. So you're not having to spend any time up here? No. Okay. <laughs> Chuck has a lot of tattoos, doesn't he? Yes. In fact, the one that's right there on your wrist, if you'll show that to the jury, please, the, the you, uh, Your Honor may Miss Dykes uh, stand up um, and present to her tattoo to the jury. Well, she may stand up where she is and okay. show her tattoo. And we're talking about the one right there on your wrist, right? Mm -hmm. This one right there. Right. You're aware that Chuck has that same tattoo, doesn't he? He does. Yes, he does. Okay. So you are a 57-year-old woman investing in a rapper's career. Um, you don't have any personal relationship at all, but you get a matching tattoo. The tattoo is actually the logo for the business that I started for him that I'm invested in, math class. That's what the tattoo is. And it's the logo for that. Now... You and Nina are really close, aren't you? Yes. You know pretty much everything about each other, right? Yes, I would think. Um, she talked to you while she was in Pennsylvania? We have consistently kept a relationship for 16 years. Okay, so she talks. you, you guys talk all the time? We do. Now, uh, you mentioned that Bill didn't live there, but if Bill didn't live in Pennsylvania, why is he keeping Halloween decorations there? That doesn't make any sense, does it? No, that's not exactly what I said. They had a house together in Staten Island where they actually resided. This house is a house where they were repairing the house to sell it as a couple or to live in it as they chose to do. Um, they did have personal property there from both of them. This Miss Scarpa just made up this fact that you guys uh, knelt there, right? Miss Scarpa had said what she said for whatever reason she did, but it was not true. Okay. And uh, Olivia Martinez, I almost said Rodriguez again, <clears throat> Olivia Martinez, she was uh, somebody that you were training, right? She was someone I trained, yes. And you guys uh, kept the same office, didn't you? She was put into my office so that I could train her. Okay, so you guys shared an office, didn't you? Yes. And uh, as anybody that shares an office, you guys get in personal uh, conversations, right? Olivia liked to listen to my phone calls. As far as personal Objection, conversations go, uh, no. Your Honor. If you could sustain, you need to listen to the specific question and answer that specific question if you can. Uh, if you don't know, then so you don't know. Okay. Um, you may proceed. Thank you. Ms. Stikes, being in the same office with someone, you get in some personal conversations, don't you? Not always, no. Okay, but you did have some personal conversations with Olivia, didn't you? About certain things. Okay. And uh, you talked to her about <coughs> Chuck sometimes, right? Honestly, no. I didn't talk to Olivia about Chuck. You never talked to her about Chuck? No. Okay, did you, you never talked to her about Nina either, did you? No, actually, Nina, she met coming into the office. Nina used to come and sit with me in the office. Okay, and you know that she testified that you all had several personal conversations at work. You recall that conversation? Right? I remember her testimony. Okay, so there's a person number two this line, right? Seems to be Olivia had some thoughts that weren't exactly correct. Okay, and... Um, Cat De Leon, she's a, she's a hairdresser. You went to her for years, didn't you? I did. And you guys were close, weren't you? No, she was my hairdresser. Okay, and as a hairdresser, uh, you know the gig. I mean, you stick with the same hairdresser for a while. They know your styles, they know your fashions, they know the things you like, right? Should, yes. Okay, and she was a good hairdresser, wasn't she? She was good with color, yes. Okay. And she was good with cuts too, wasn't she? Not so much. Then why'd you keep going? Because she was good with color. 
Okay. Um, but she still cut her hair too, didn't she? She did, yes. Okay. And uh, she was so good that you took Chelsea there too, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Um, you didn't have any personal conversations with Kat either, did you? We did have personal conversations. We so sure you did. told her about Chuck? Uh, I did tell her that Chuck was there in the house, yes. Okay, and you told her about your, you talked about him all the time, didn't you? No, not all the time. Uh, you talked about him frequently to her, didn't you? When she asked, I answered her. And of course, if he was this mean, awful, violent person, you could have told her, you would have told her that. Not necessarily. But you told her about the sex, didn't you? No, I didn't. You didn't tell her anything about you guys having uh, any kind of sexual relationship? No, I didn't because that wouldn't be true. Nina spent quite a bit of time after Bill died in Pennsylvania by herself, right? I don't remember exactly how long she was there. Um, she first, whenever, yeah, when Bill died, she was in Pennsylvania, yes. Okay, so that was November. You guys actually started taking trips and things together um, on a fairly regular basis uh, in maybe the summer of 2019. Does that sound about right? No, I think that's too soon. October 2019? Um, yeah, probably. Okay, and then he passes in, uh, and that's when you guys really kind of started going from being best friends to taking this to a different level, right? Nina and I still to this day are best friends, so the commitment to Ashley Mary didn't come until April or May. I'm not 20. talking about marriage mistakes. I'm talking about where you all start discussing and making a decision that this isn't just a best friend buddy situation, that we're going to be in a, a different type of relationship. That happened um, around October 2019, is that right? I think that's way too soon. Okay. It wasn't but if you better. told Cat De Leon that it was October 2019, um, that's mistaken? I think Cat's probably off on that because okay. we really didn't start even remotely thinking about anything like that until 20. Uh, Bill passes in 2019, is that correct? I really don't remember. I think so. November 2019, right? I believe so. And you and Lisa. I'm sorry, you and Nina, um, y'all start getting closer and closer. Is that fair to say? Yes, she was going through a lot of things. I mean, we were already extremely, extremely close, but her suffering from Bill dying was pretty extraordinary, so yes. Okay, and, and you knew about some of her relationships too, is that right? I did. You knew that she was uh, having a relationship with a guy in uh, Pennsylvania. I can't recall his name, but you remember that he was, she was having a relationship with a guy in Pennsylvania. Um, no, she didn't really have a relationship with anybody in Pennsylvania. She uh, yeah. saw somebody maybe in Pennsylvania, but not a relationship. Okay, relationship might be a little uh, more than what it was, but she was texting the guy and she saw a guy and they had sex. Uh, while she was in Pennsylvania, is that? I, I think so, yes. And uh, you know that, I mean, she texts this guy and she told that guy all about you, her fiance, and all about Chuck the third. I don't know, I never saw anything like that. It was clear that you guys were open about what the deal was. You and Nina were married and Chuck was your, your, your guy. No, he wasn't. Now, as far as Kyle's concerned, Kyle lives here in Dallas, doesn't he? Yes. And uh, he was uh, the, I guess, manager of the bar? Is he that was. Right? Yes. Uh, on premise? Yes. And he actually hired Chuck, is that right? Yes. And Dax also worked there, is that correct? Dax was working as a bouncer at that time. And Chuck was a doorman? Yeah, well, he was a bouncer too. They were both working in the same position. Um, that's how you met Chuck, through your son Kyle, is that correct? Yes. 
You mentioned to the jury that uh, Chuck got, and Kyle cares a whole lot about you, doesn't he? I, I believe so, yes. He's I mean, you son. guys uh, still to this day, you all talk all the time, right? We do. And uh, he'll pretty much do anything for you, is that correct? I don't know. I haven't got any new clo new clothes for court yet, so I can't really say that. No. Well, that, that's because he'd have to appear here in the court building to get you those clothes, right? That's not true. I mean, you told him to stay away, didn't you? No. You didn't tell him to stay away? No. Well, I have, like, not wanted him to be up here because of the risk for him and the, the danger of being around all these people. Here, I don't know. We approach.